Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger and super happy to be here with you for this show. Dare to Dream podcast has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award, as well as listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. I'm always humbled and so grateful for that kind of recognition for the work I put into this show. So thank you so much. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. And if you would like to become a facilitator or take a course anywhere in the globe, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com or accessconsciousness.com and you can look up all their products programs and classes there. I am Debbie Dashinger, and I teach entrepreneurs, business owners, and folks just like you the highly effective steps to write an engaging book. I also run a company that takes books to a guaranteed international bestseller. And the third leg of my visibility hub is teaching you how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and getting massive results. I've got a gift for you. And that gift shows you how to start becoming more visible right now through templates that you can fill in and get going and through videos. Go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. And I'm excited about today's show because I always love meeting new people or people that I've been aware of that finally come into my unified field, if you will, because today's episode is about bridging science and consciousness, ancient wisdom, and unified physics. My guest today is Adam Apollo. It's not often I meet somebody who also has an alliteration of names, Adam Apollo AA, who shares insights on global transitions, physics, technology, human spirituality, and the future as a next generation leadership ambassador at the White House in multiple nexus and other summits at the United Nations and at conferences and festivals around the world. And soon he will be a featured speaker at the Los Angeles Conscious Life Expo. Adam is a co-founder of the Unify Movement, which has reached over 100 million people and two education and technology-based companies called Access Granted and Superluminal systems. He's an active faculty member, author, and the lead systems architect for several international online academies, including the Resonance Academy for Unified Physics and the Guardian Alliance Academy for Self-Mastery, with over 100,000 active students of all ages from around the world across these schools. He's been featured on Gaia TV shows, Coast to Coast AM on multiple occasions, feature films, and more. Adam Apollo is dedicated to achieving a sustainable and thriving interplanetary culture. To learn more, go to his website at adamapollo.com. And to be clear, the AA had nothing to do with 12 steps. It's just A to the second degree, like my name, Debbie Dashinger, D to the second degree. <laughs> and with that, I welcome Adam to the Dare to Dream show. It's so great to have you. Thank you so much, Debbie. It's it's really a pleasure to be with you. And um, yeah, the AA was no mistake. I had really cool parents and uh, they named me Adam Apollo. It's on my birth certificate. Um, and uh, it's taking the Apollo into my name was something that was part of my own deep personal transition when I was in high school and starting to really claim who I am. And I realized there's a lot of Adams out there, but I don't think there's many people named Adam Apollo, so I think I'll just introduce myself that way from now on. And uh, it was a good shift. And I like being double A. I'm actually triple A now. <laughs> what's, the, what's the third A? Well, my last name is Amor Estrella. Um, I'm now divorced, but by marriage, we changed our last names. And uh, and so I'm triple A. Um and uh, now that I'm divorced, I might be changing my name again, but the names that we're looking at are all A names, so. Good, keep it going, it works for you. Thanks. And I'm glad you cleared that up because I was really curious. It's an amazing name. It's a very futuristic yeah. name. Mm. And when you were saying, you know, you started to claim yourself in high school, mm -hmm. started to really step into your being, 
tell me about that because you know you really are a very futuristic guy the way you do business the way you show up in the world the way you dress you know all the elements of you feel sort of this worldly and otherworldly which i like so talk about that because that must have had a gestation period for you to fully step in and claim you yeah it really was um really in the range of 1995 to 2005 was really that big arc of my personal transformation and claiming of who I am and, and getting used to owning and acknowledging the reality that um, we as beings are not just isolated to this time or these bodies, but we have been on a long journey. And for me, that journey really started when I discovered that I have a human energy field and I realized that the energy around my body is responsive to my consciousness and getting in touch with that opened up so many doors for me, because I'll be honest with you, Debbie and, and the audience, I was really depressed when I was in middle school. I, uh, there were times I thought about killing myself. There were, um, I'd been through a lot. I'd lost family members to death and, gone, went through this massive um, portal of self-transformation where I really just didn't know what was true anymore. I didn't know what was real. I didn't know why I was here or what it was about. And these few simple experiments that led me to discovering that I have this tangible field that would move with my intention and that I could use to locate objects blindfolded and that I could use to do martial arts blindfolded um, with my friends really was like unlocking a door in my consciousness that opened up this vast realm of possibilities. And, and I was completely stunned that no one in school had ever taught me about this, that there was no teacher, that there was no class teaching about the vital force around the human body. And the deeper I dove into that, the more I realized there's a serious problem in our educational structure and in our academic institutions, because the most foundational thing, which is actually our own field, our own vibratory field, is not even being acknowledged. I mean, we talk about the body radiating heat. We talk about electromagnetism. We talk about the quantum field, but there was literally nothing to describe what consciousness is, how it moves around the body, and how we are actually connected to things. I mean, even the idea that in physics, entanglement is something that we just think about happening between atoms, but we never associate to our natural psychological processes. Wow. I was like, this is a massive problem. And so I became, uh, frankly, somewhat obsessed with the study of theoretical physics, um, metaphysics, and the stories of ancient cultures, because I realized that all of these different cultures around the world already talked about this. They used this fundamental field for healing, for calling in the rain, for speaking and communing with nature, for entangling with each other magically, um, and, and building connections, you know, through mythology and through history and through time. And somehow all of that was missing from our cultural context in the present age. And, and that, um, that journey eventually led me to not only the discovery of my own lifetimes on earth, but eventually to realize that I am not from this planet mm -hmm. and that originally I came here from another world. And that idea blew my mind again. The idea that some of us might not even be from earth, that we could have come from somewhere else, that some of the ancient wisdom and knowledge of languages and mathematics and things like that might actually be galactic and not just based here. Um, talk about a context changer and a game changer for how you relate to the world and to society, and also how you relate to the potential that we can achieve in the future. So you have this revolutionary experience and you realize there is a field around me and consciousness actually tells it what it's going to do and create, and you become obsessed with it. And what happens? What are some reference point, reference point, like moments 
where things you start to see, this is working. Something's happening here. I can utilize this. I can harness this. Mm. Yeah. I mean, honestly, the, the amount of stories that I have from those days is wild. And I don't tell most of them very often because there were so many miraculous experiences and miraculous moments. But I, I, I can tell you that there were times where you know, I was feeling a certain way and asking for a certain thing and wishing that I had a certain thing. And I just like breathed into that feeling. And then all of a sudden somebody walked up to me and offered me the exact thing I was asking for. Um, I, I had times where I played with time travel, um, where I was actually messing with clocks and figuring out that if nobody else had any frame of reference for my movement through time, that my actual travel from work to home could frankly happen instantaneously. Um, and that was one that took me a, a long time to even process. And I'm not even sure I fully even today understand exactly how it worked, except for that I was meditating on the reality that as long as there were other cars and other people witnessing my movement, and I was moving within that collective field, then I would be within a relative time frame with everyone else. But if I was not in a space when anyone else could see me, I could effectively be moving through time in a different way because my own individual lens is its own frame of reference. And what happened basically was I left work at a certain time and I arrived home at the exact same time as I left work with my clock on the, in the car. And I put something in front of the clock so that I wouldn't look at the clock the whole way um, to test this theory. And I've had many, many wild experiences that, you know, I'm sure a lot of your listeners can relate to miracles happening, synchronicities that are just insane probability levels, um, you know, being at a dance party and invoking the element of water as I was playing with some fundamentals in magic and then feeling completely refreshed and then having somebody literally walk up to me within 30 seconds, handing me a bottle of water, like, here you go, you know, out of nowhere. Um, so there's, there's a lot of amazing things. And since I've refined that work and realized that, you know, the magic of creation is not just about just, you know, tricks or making cool things happen or having cool experiences, but is actually about uh, guiding the force of where your life goes and how you can be in service and what ways you can serve yourself and love yourself in terms of giving that service. So having a house that you feel really great about and comfortable in, you know, having a car that makes you feel really good and that drives well and that, you know, doesn't break down often. And, you know, having um, just basic things that, that take care of us and that enable us to be more powerful in our service to society and to the world. And I think those things are worth manifesting for ourselves. And I also think that collectively we can do a huge amount of service by actually manifesting change through our communion with each other, which is what led me to co-founding Unify back in 2012 and the Guardian Alliance work and unified physics work that I've been doing for many, many years. Your business stuff is really fascinating. You know, in researching you, I was checking out your websites, which is more like I wanted to put on some VR goggles and just <laughs> go inside your websites because I don't know who you hired to create that. But <laughs> That's like, all me. Oh, it's beautiful. It's just a Thanks. journey and intriguing and it's like being in a game. And mm -hmm. so how did what you're describing, how, how do you utilize that today to manifest mm -hmm. who you be out in the world, this you know, Burning Man guy, DJ, teacher, businessman, web guy, you know, creating new likes media platforms and all that. Mm -hmm. How how does that come up for you? Where do the ideas come from? How do you know how to manifest them? Or do you just use this field in order to channel and let things come to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of my interests and my work in the world are really just about my own loves and passions. You know, I, I love music. So I, I had a friend who went to Mexico when I was 18 in 1999, and he left his turntables and a bunch of vinyl with me. And I just fell in love with mixing music and 
realizing I could take this amazing work that somebody else has created and I can create a journey out of it. I can create new experiences out of that. So I've always loved to be a DJ um, and, and sets of music, I think really can tell a story uh, about an emotional story. They can tell a mental story that can empower us. You know, the sets that I create are designed to help shift energy in different ways and or deal with emotional energy in different ways. And they've been deep medicine for me. And I really made them for myself. Um, but I, I enjoy sharing them with others. And I love it when others check them out and listen to them. You guys listening in, I have a SoundCloud slash Adam Apollo or on my website, you can, you know, go and find all my music and download all my sets. They're all free and, and open and available to people. Um, and I, I'd say that, you know, in terms of my business and my work and my projects, um, I've always been most interested in what are the highest leverage points for the transformation of consciousness that enables people to know who they are more fully, step into their power more fully, and give their greatest gift in the world. Because I honestly believe that if people all have the level of freedom in their consciousness, sovereignty from uh, let's say invasive programming and, and from traumas and from things like that, when they've liberated themselves from the, the field of the pain and the challenges they've gone through and the kind of collective pressures that they may be under. And they began to actually tap into that wellspring of magic within them and the gift inside of them to give to the world. I believe that if everybody could just do that, we would have an incredibly peaceful, thriving, advancing society where we'd have a huge amount of collective collaboration, connection. And there are communities that I'm a part of that are that way. And I witnessed them being that way. Um, and yet everyone these days has to face the reality that there are still invasive programs that can come in and sideswipe us and tell us, this is good, this is bad. You know, if you do this, you're okay and you're a normal member of society. And if you don't, you're, you're a bad member of society. And I caution and warn people that any divisive programs like that are really temporary for one thing. And two, um, they're really things that we need to in ourselves look at and assess how much are we gonna buy into that? Because if we do really buy into it, then suddenly we get wrapped up in the collective storm of energy and the karma that's around it. But if we can stay detached from it and witness, okay, you know what? You may say this is good. You may say this is bad, but I'm not going to judge people. I'm going to actually accept people for whatever they choose. Now, suddenly you've taken a stance that is loving and in support of all life and all people. And I think that that's the kind of fundamental shifts I'm interested in making, especially in my tech work is like, look, when you give people the power to connect privately and sovereignly with each other, they just do better. If you, if you take away the throttling that happens on social media, well, more people get their word and their message out there. When you stop trying to censor everything everybody's doing because you have one perspective or another, or you're afraid of one thing or another, um, then people start really thriving and blooming and our society becomes more artistic, more responsible, more advanced. Um, and all of that, I think, is best modeled by some of the galactic communities that I've been in connection with for a long time and that we're in a natural maturing process towards being more of that kind of civilization. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Also, I think often medicine circles are very much like that, very pro-tribe and very mm -hmm. loving and supportive, uh, very harmonious. So you yeah. mentioned past lives and you mentioned that you discovered that you had come from another planet. And it's my understanding that we actually all are basically this genetic material from other planets. What did you discover about your extraterrestrial connection and have you had UFO ET experience firsthand? Yeah, um, quite significant. Um, for those of you that have a membership on Gaia, you can go to interviews with Ed, interviews with ED, 
Extra Dimensionals. Um, it's a show created by Ruben Langdon. And yeah, have... Ruben's been on the show before, and he's a oh, great friend of mine. And I'm glad you're promoting it because it's a show worth watching. Yeah. Yeah, Ruben's done some great work collecting some really amazing people um, and some just fantastic stories. And my own journey uh, with that is something that I shared over two episodes with him because it's a long story. And I really like to set good context um, and understanding for those people that are more scientific, those people that really want uh, effective ways to be able to start communicating about these kinds of experiences. Um, so I did my best to really provide a toolkit for anyone to onboard somebody else into the reality that we're not alone and that people have been visiting this world for a long time. And my own personal experience, I met an extraterrestrial being in the middle of the desert uh, that wasn't human. And then that was followed by having a bilocation experience where I met beings, ambassadors from all over the galaxy. And this encounter fundamentally changed my life. But what was most fascinating about it is that in the moment, it wasn't surprising at all because I had just gotten connected into, in myself, to the reality that I realized and remembered that I wasn't from this world. And I, I remembered the sister that I had that I came to this planet with, um, my Syrian sister, who was a partner for a time in this life in, when I was in college and who I remembered many of my lifetimes with. And it was truly a healing journey. And I think that for a lot of people, um, there's a pivot that needs to occur to really deepen your experience of contact and or connection in these ways. And that pivot is about moving from the state where you're looking for it as some kind of phenomenology, like prove to me that you exist, you know, show me something cool in the sky and moving to more about a deep curiosity about who you are and where you're from and who your connections are and who are these beings and why are they here and why have they come here? And so I pulled that thread personally. And as I did that, um, I began to discover that there is literally records of contact with different extraterrestrial beings throughout our history, going back as far as our history goes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then literally found uh, through friends of mine, like Robert Schock and Graham Hancock and uh, Nassim Hermain, who's a close friend of mine and I worked with on the Resonance Academy and built that with him um, and others, that, you know, all of these different places around the world with evidence around these connections also point to a civilization that existed before the flood, a pre-cataclysmic civilization, and a civilization that was, frankly, advanced technologically in ways that we are not, with the capacity to move multi, you know, hundred ton stones and cut them with laser sharp precision, uh, things that it would have taken you know, a freight train sized turntable and a two story tall diamond saw to create somehow they created, moved in position and brought the stone a hundred from a hundred miles away to do so. And these kinds of things engineering wise now are ridiculously hard challenges to overcome with cranes and trains and massive things to build machines. And clearly we have no evidence of those machines from then. And so what we know is that there was this highly advanced civilization, that there was clearly connection with other star systems all over the world. And we have even DNA and, uh, and skeletal evidence and mummif mummified remains that prove that some of those connections existed. Do you think that you're a hybrid? I've been here uh, since the time that many call Atlantis, which was just before the end of the last ice age. And at that time, um, I was born into a society that was hybridized between Syrians and humans. Um, and my own work in exploring that has showed me that it's likely that a lot of our major racial divisions on this planet are actually due to hybridizations with different 
extraterrestrial species who are very similar to us, by the way. We're not talking grays with crazy eyes and big heads and, you know, or super eight foot tall, long armed beings and the kinds of things that have been popularized mostly by disinformation campaigns in our government, but also because some of those species do exist. Um, but beings that literally you could walk down the street right next to and you wouldn't even realize that it wasn't a human, you know, especially if they had their ears covered or, or whatever. And, um, and in, in my own exploration of this, uh, what I've found is that I have incarnated into many, many different races throughout my lifetimes on Earth, but I have in some ways maintained some amount of my appearance and some amount of my own soul genome in that process. Mm. And this led me to really inquire deeper into the nature of DNA and realized uh, through my studies in genetics that it seems clear that we're not just merging our uh, paternal and maternal lines, in other words, our mother and father DNA lines, but we are also adding a third trinity codex to those lines. And that third codex is actually DNA that is the information structure of our soul's incarnation cycle. And so we're literally bringing through our genetics and our DNA, merging into our mother and father lines, our own soul spiritual DNA. And that shows up differently for everyone. But I've been able to identify that you can tell in the way that someone looks and in the way they've embodied into their current genetics you can tell if they have genetics that have come from another star system because there are very specific qualities that have been sort of programmed into their genetics because they grew up around a different star. And each star has its own very particular frequency bands and each planet around each star also has its own particular living structures and, and bands of energy and that shapes the soul, so to speak. Mm, very interesting. I definitely know I have a Lyran or Lyrian, definitely from the planet Lyra. Because yeah, uh, I see people, that in you. yeah, exactly. People say it all the time. And so I'm also heavily into music and I have a band, I sing, and we do mm. um, music as medicine and we call mm. ourselves Lions of Lyra. And it's beautiful. It's just so befitting, right? Uh, to honor yeah. this time. I love everything you're saying, and I, I really appreciate this understanding of the hodgepodge of who we are and how you got here and all the, what you really allowed to come through you as your past. Had, did it have a great influence, understanding past lives here, understanding past lives in other planets? Did it change you? Absolutely. Mind? Yeah, it had a massive influence on me. I started having those memories. Um, the first ones were in high school, but I didn't really understand that I was having past life memory. It took until I was in college um, to actually go, oh my God, okay, this is not just a vision. This is not just, you know, a glimpse at something else. This is a memory. Um, and it actually took uh, being at a Halloween party and I'd, I'd been having these downloads and memories come in with this woman who... I was dating her roommate in college. And so that kind of ended up being a mess because I was dating her roommate, but now I'm having memories and dreams with her. Like, oh dear, that's a problem. Um, and, and then I end up this Halloween party and this gentleman that neither of us really knew well, but who was uh, in kind of dating uh, this other girl who was friends with these women. Um, he gets really drunk and he starts apologize crying and apologizing to me and to her for crimes that he committed against us back in the middle ages and he's literally speaking these things and as he's saying them i i'm having full visceral experiences of the pain of the anger of what i, I didn't know this guy and i'm literally having this full experience of deep energetic reconciliation and memory of the fact that he and I killed each other mm -hmm. in my courtyard, in my castle, mm -hmm. you know, and I remember like literally dripping sweat and smelling the oil fires burning and people watching and slipping on the paving stones as I'm 
trying to hold my own against him, you know, and we're battling to the point where we're completely exhausted and, and realizing that I had to end it somehow. And, and I did, but it ended up with us both dying. And that's a longer story to that. Um, but it's, it, that, that level of visceral experiential memory coming through a third party who's even speaking the names that she and I had had a dream about with each other, you know, and not told anybody <laughs> um, was the third party verification that really moved me from this is a phenomenon I'm experiencing to this is something I need to study scientifically and I need to approach from a psychological perspective in that way. Um, and I began really exploring it and adventuring within it. And what I found was the answer to a ton of questions I had, like, why was I always into swords since I was a tiny little kid? And why is it that every time I picked up a sword, I felt like I already knew how to use it. And I, I knew how to move it around my body. And why did I have certain skills and certain knowledge? And how did I know about these different geometries when I was 15 and I start downloading a library of sacred geometries with all their magical applications is like somehow I've got this huge book of alchemy and, and magic and elementals and, and creation systems like inside my head, like where'd that come from? And, and it, the answer was that, well, I'd been refining these practices and this knowledge and these abilities and these interests and these skills for thousands of years. And, you know, I, I, I often say to people, if you spent 30 years in another lifetime mastering a particular skill, why would you start over from scratch now? Wouldn't you want to remember and reclaim that? Absolutely. And then suddenly it just clicks for people. It's like, oh, yeah those things that you're just naturally so good at and you have no idea why you're so good at it. Well, it's because you've already done it for a long time. Um, and you're just remembering, you're just bringing back into your body, remembering in your body, um, how to operate with that portion of your consciousness. Gosh. Yeah. So I want to take this as a segue into the idea of exactly what you're saying, which is ancient wisdom unified mm -hmm. physics, because I know you said that there are intersections between mm -hmm. consciousness, between magic, between the philosophies of ancient cultures and the science of unified physics of space time. So can you talk a little bit about where these overlap? Where do they meet? Yeah, well, my own personal journey into unified physics started with geometry and realizing that that there is a geometric formula to the way that elements in the universe express themselves. You could start with, you know, fire, air, earth, water, spirit, right? You've got this in all kinds of cultures around the world. And you've got all these cultures around the world that point to this geometry. It's a five pointed star, right? Well, why? Why is it that geometry? And what does that have to do with matter? And why is that connected to all of these cultures in relationship to magic? Well, I discovered over time as I studied this, that if you start to look at space time as this energetic fabric that, that is highly energetic and has a level of tensegrity within itself, that's a Buckminster Fuller term, meaning that each point, each node in this fabric of energy has a strong push radiation, and it also has a strong pull attraction. And so it's pushing and pulling off of each other, right? Now, what happens is that you start to get this sort of natural unfolding of geometry. Now, I was studying this work called Loop Quantum Gravity with this guy, Lee Smolin, who'd wrote this great book called Three Roads to Quantum Gravity. And I was uh, 17, I think, at the time when I was really deep in that one. And, and he he literally had solved some of the first equations for how gravity works at the quantum scale, but they didn't understand. They knew that all of the geometry at the Planck scale, the smallest possible scale, if you go all the way down beneath atoms, all the way down to the structure of space-time, that space-time must be this structure, but what does that structure look like? 
And he was like, maybe it's this crazy quantum foam thing. And it does all of this weird stuff, you know, because there was really a lot of popularity in quantum foam and string theory and stuff at the time. And I looked at it and I was like, no, the geometry that's underlying space time is going to be geometry that we see fractally represented at all other scales, including in our own consciousness. And I got into Buckminster Fuller and I realized through Bucky's work that the same way that an, a high tensegrity structure, which is basically all triangles, the same way that a structure like that curves, which is a pentagon, is the same mechanism that creates curvature in space time. And I realized that the five pointed star, that pentagram, that thing that, you know, all these cultures say is like how they create or talk to the winds or connect to the elements, the physical elements of reality. I realized that that very geometry is the geometry that gravity comes from. It's what enables gravity. And more importantly, it's what enables mass to exist. In other words, when you follow that all the way through, you realize that every atom is full of protons and neutrons, as we call them, right? But they're literally all protons, and protons are what make mass. Protons is what gives us the weight of our bottles. It's what gives us the lightness of the air. It's what gives us the different densities of the elements that we see comes from the weight of the, the atomic core, what's going on in the proton. And the only way a proton can even exist as a little sphere of energy is because of those five pointed stars. That's actually what allows space time to curve itself into a bundle that gives you a proton. And so these ancient cultures had the key for how mass is created how physical world, the world we live in is created. They were already had it and we just didn't know it. We didn't realize it. And I began to realize this was in high school. I began to realize that every one of these things that we call sacred geometries, the flower of life pattern, the five pointed star, the seven pointed star, the heptagon, um, these geometries are not just sacred in terms of their patterns and consciousness and the way they show up with numbers and the ways that they've been used across ancient cultures throughout time, but they're actually the foundational geometries for the physics of space-time itself. They are the unifying factor to space-time physics. And believe me, I kept pulling that thread for the last 20 years, you know, and I'll tell you now, what I know now is so far beyond that in realizing that literally all of the mechanics, all of the forces, the way electromagnetism works, the way we connect and entangle with objects and become attached to objects, literally energetically, the way we telepathically connect, the way that mothers connect to their children when they're not around them, all of these mechanisms are based on these very, very simple sacred geometric intersections in vibrations of energy. Beautiful. So one of your focuses is on practical, magical applications for daily life. Yeah. So let's take where you are right now and let's dive a little bit into the sacred heart of magic itself. Can you share mm. some practical, magical applications that we can use? For yeah, good sure. <laughs> Absolutely. So when you realize that these geometries are not just important to our consciousness and the way that our consciousness operates, but they actually connect us to space-time. Um, and the mechanism for that being the chakras, the chakras are literally vibrational geometric gateways in our body that are like interface plugins to the structure of space. So just like on your computer, you've got a power cable, you've got an audio cable that's running your headset, you know, you've got, uh, you know, maybe a USB-C cable that's connecting to a hard drive. Each of those different cables is designed with a geometry that lets it move energy of a certain kind in a certain way. 
right? It's all electrical energy, but the electrical energy that's routed to my headset is different from the electrical energy that's routed to my hard drive, right? And so our bodies similarly have these ports that connect to space time around us and let us in a way, both program space time and let space time program us. And so if we start with that five pointed star, a really simple example, is that we have this vehicle that's connected to how mass and matter, the physical world that we experience is generated, right? And so literally visualizing a five-pointed star or a pentagram will connect you to the elementals of fire, air, earth, water, and their transcendent spirit or ether, which is interconnected through and in all of those right? So there's, imagine a higher vibrational form. In other words, there's energy itself. And then there's how energy moves when it's in a state of fire or how energy moves when it's in a state of water or energy moves in earth. And so, you know, as simple as invoking how energy moves as fire into your own body will warm up your body temperature invoking the way energy moves as water into your own body will cause you to salivate. It's happening right now. <laughs> and, and, and actually help your body recognize its own nourishment. You may even start to sweat if you invoke a lot of water and a lot of fire at the same time, because you're heating your body and creating a, a connection to water. Now, you can also not just invoke those in your body, but communicate to the world around you with those invocations, which is what Druids and Nordic Magi and others have done for thousands of years when they go to ask for rain, when they go to try to calm the fires in the land, when they go to, to intersect with things. And there's alchemy principles for each one of the elements that you can learn and develop use of in order to relate to life and space better. Now, there's also, you know, simple applications of boundary conditions you can create with this as well. And this is what I like to call, you know, developing your event horizon or warding. Um, for example, you know, one of the oldest practical applications of the five-pointed star was to visualize it in a circle around you and say, I choose to only allow those physical things which serve my highest and best good to enter this circle. And I'm choosing for anything else to be outside of this circle. Now, if you practically apply this, and I've done it many times, you can put that around your car and it'll actually help make sure that your system and your relationship to space time is responsive in such a way that if a car swerves into your lane, you will literally feel it and move with the energy of it so that the barrier that you've put around the car is maintained between you and that object. It's actually a feedback system. So your body and your own intentional creation reinforces your relationship to space time around you. Now, also the six pointed star, the hexagon has many, many, many kinds of uses. Um, the most practical of which for me on a regular basis is actually just clearing when I have a really heavy emotion that's taking over my process. So what I do is I actually visualize the six pointed star um, and I place a color on each of the points. So instead of fire, question. air, earth, and water, go so, ahead. Excuse me. So folks who... I know folks are going to be interested in this. Yeah. When you say the six-pointed star specifically, is this like the Star of David? Uh, yeah, sure. That's one name for it. It's it's called a hexagram. I mean, it's just a fundamental geometry. A uh, hexagram or hexagon, uh, either of those things are fine. So it's basically six points evenly distributed in a circle. The same as with the five-pointed star, the pentagram is five points equally distributed in a circle. So you want balance, equilateral distribution. And what I see is the colors on each one of those points. It's basically the color wheel that you learned about in school, right? So you have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. And this makes for this nice balanced energy of the spectrum. And what I realized is that every emotion 
is a combination of vibrations that have a certain note or a certain frequency, mm. right? So, so if you're, you're not sure what the heck you're feeling, it's because you're feeling some passion and some elation and you're feeling some of something else and it's all convoluted together. But when you feel in your feeling body, this circle around you and you start to feel red and feel orange and feel yellow and feel green and blue and purple, then what happens is inside of your own consciousness vehicle, you start separating out all of that mixed up funk all out into this beautiful, clear geometry, this clear circle of energies. And you can actually feel exactly what each feeling is. And you're now in the center point, you're in the white light in the middle. And so you're coming from this place of stillness of unity, of wholeness, and you're able to now uh, sort of pull apart all of the emotional energies and see them for what they are and where they came from. Do the colors, do the different points actually speak to you and give you information that helps assist your process? Oh yeah, definitely. And I, I'd say that what I notice most in this practice is that as I go and I'm like feeling red, feeling orange, feeling yellow, feeling green, as I'm meditating on each of the colors, I'll notice that some are bright and some of them I, I can't see very well. Mm. And when I notice I can't see one or I'm not experiencing it very well, that's the one I focus on because then I'm bringing that, that energy back up into my awareness and by enhancing that color and sort of balancing all of the colors together, suddenly now I find myself in this state of peace and equilibrium between all of those masses of energy. Oh, this is so great. I'm going to try this. That's yeah. very cool, great. practical magic. So magic is part of your life on a daily basis. It is, but I don't think about it that way anymore. Um, nowadays, it's just like, I just, I just move with things and there's a lot that I do intuitively. There's a lot that my subconscious takes care of now that I don't even consciously process anymore. Um, but, but it's, it's, there's certainly a period as I got really good at it, that I started noticing that things that used to be problems for me or that I struggled with a lot were just suddenly not anymore. And I, I began to notice that I, I, I took on new challenges, right? A lot of what I work with nowadays is mental field stuff. And, and particularly around the, uh, the paradoxical division between our unity and our interconnection with others in relationship and with verse and our individualized self, um, which there's a lot of very, very fascinating things as you explore that, because you start to realize that only one being in the universe has the experience that you have. Your journey is your own through all of time. No one else has that journey. No one else has all those points of reference. However, other people do share experiences of energetic processes that are similar to what you've gone through or will go through. And the beauty of relationship is that each of our journeys gives us all different codes. And hopefully we find ourselves coming into connection with others in the exact moments that we need the medicine that those people are bringing to us. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that you start to see the sort of mind of God might be one way to put it, where you begin to realize that every event and every experience and every person brought to us is part of a teaching. It's part of a self-reflection and it's part of our fundamental journey. And that can be extraordinarily powerful when we begin taking responsibility for that and begin actually looking for the meaning in all of our encounters. Yeah. I think this is really the time, some of the things you touch on like Jedi training intensives and galactic mm -hmm. initiations. So for people in this audience who are interested in this type of, we'll call it metaphysical self-development practices also really longing to be on the path of purpose. What are your recommendations for this? We are in a new year and beyond. What is it all about? What should we be looking for? And 
what are the new cutting edge and necessary components for us? Yeah, well, being in the turning of a new year, I think that one of the things that I really like to emphasize for people is the importance and the power of creating a sovereign field around you. The reality is that we're all mixed up in a mess of things. And some of us obsess over stories in the news and collective concerns and where's the world going to go and are we going to be forced to do this or do that. And when we put a lot of mental energy into that, we also experience a lot of the intensity of the emotional swings that people are going through who are dealing with some serious issues right now. And all of us, all of us are empathic, whether we know it or not. And there can be a huge amount of our own life force and energy that gets sort of drained in getting swept around and thrown around by the collective field. Mm. And so establishing personal sovereignty is really about getting clear about just what's going on inside of you. You know, what thoughts in what considerations and what meditations are really yours in regards to your life and the world and which ones are programs that somebody else is trying to put in your mind. And I'm not saying it's good or bad that programs get put in people's minds. I'm sharing a lot of things which are programs which are hopefully going to upgrade people's life systems right now. And there are also programs that definitely can downgrade us, can definitely, you know, sap our energy, create fear. Um, and so by being opening up our beings to acknowledging what is within us and what is part of the collective is the first step in actually creating a clear space within ourselves to get in touch with what our personal will is really about and what it is that we really want to do and what we're here to do. And then we're also not motivated by fear and reaction. If everything I do is like, that's happening, I better react and post this, or that's happening, I better do this. When we're moving in reaction to things, we are literally in a state of ping-ponging. Uh, we, we're putting ourselves in tension, in tensegrity. Our intention is connecting us to the very things that we're fighting. And so we actually experience more of that, more fighting, more battle, more struggle. And when we put our intention, we go into tension with our deep self-exploration, our soul, who we are, what are we here to do? How can we give more love? How can we show up more fully in our lives? How can we experience more, uh, more peace in our world and actually be generators of more peace in the world? Then we are in tension with those things. We are actually creating growth dynamics inside of ourselves to improve our own nature and how we serve in the world. So it's really where you put your mind, where you put your attention has a lot to do with what you experience. And these days, I don't even, I basically ignore most news most of the time. Every once in a while, I check in, I check this, I check that, I see what's going on, I see where things are happening, I notate it. If I can do something about it, great. If I can't do anything about it, then what, what worth does it have putting my attention on it? Because as long as I am, I'm just experiencing it and I feel powerless to do anything about it. So um, when you're in that inner state of intention and interconnection with who you are, you have a more refined sense of what is where your power is. And that gives you purpose and what you can do. And then you begin to actually generate things that can help people. So like I felt really, really personally um, powerless around a lot of things like health mandates and things like that that are going out. And so what I did is I spent some time looking at what am I working on and what am I doing that could actually make a change in this way. And it ended up leading me down a rabbit hole where I discovered a particular type of trust that you can put your body in that literally exempts your body from statutory law 
whether yeah. that's mandates or whatever else, any kind of statutory law, and restores your body as part of your common and natural law structure. And there's a few vehicles for that. And I have a video on YouTube. If you guys are interested, you can just look invincible trusts. And I talk about the whole thing and give a link to a course created by some really cool guys who did a huge amount of work and templated a lot of stuff. But, but that was my way. And by actually just really focusing on how can I serve in this place that I'm really concerned for the collective around, then I found where my power was and I found purpose and I found invigoration in giving a gift that would support people in those areas. So that's an example application of this. That's a powerful example right now because there's a lot of people, including me, who will be very interested in seeing that. And um, mm -hmm. it's interesting to hear you go through this explanation, very well fleshed out. I've got a, a client who I adore and she calls this element you're talking about, this doing so much, this accumulating, being, trying, exerting, efforting. She calls this her need for speed. So <laughs> nice. Good. So apropos. And so we yeah. have, have her on a contrary curriculum because that's really what mm. creates, right? And yes. And when you're you're talking about, you know, these ways of being and, and being sovereign. I, I want to ask you because sovereign by sovereignty is my word for this year. Yeah. Self-empowered sovereign sovereignty. It's exactly the energy for someone who says, I would like to stand there. I would like to command like that. I would like to get peaceful and go inside. But what, what, what is sovereignty? How would I know what sovereignty is for me? How would I know the real authentic me? Because that does mm -hmm. exist out there. And I think mm -hmm. since that's the powerful place to start, how would you describe that to somebody? Yeah, well, I don't think there's a simple answer to that question. The, you know, the, it, the, the most simplicity that I can give it is to say that the journey of sovereignty is a journey. It's one of exploring and discovering yourself. Um, and it's truly the journey of, of, I'd say, some of the most profound healing that we can go through because it actually helps us to acknowledge what is ours and also see what behaviors, what patterns, what aspects of ourselves are actually based on programs we took on as kids, programs we took on from abusive step parents, programs we took on from who knows what, you know, a friend, a relationship, a marriage, or whatever. Um, and, and so sovereignty is this dynamic dance of getting to know really who you are and doing so by also getting to know what's not you, right? I think that in the space of the oneness movement and the new age movement and like the, we're all one. And I mean, I co-founded an organization called Unify, you know, so it's all about like how we're unified together. Um, th there is a lot of beautiful, beautiful stuff but there's also some dangerous concepts like the idea that you're just one with everything and everyone and taking that on as a mental concept actually makes you extraordinarily permeable and makes you not actually know how to set boundaries correctly. You know, I, I don't know some of you out there may have had the experience of like, you know, you've got the hippie friend who comes to stay with you and they're like, dude, it's cool. We're all one. And they're like, so one with you and your house that they're leaving their <laughs> stuff everywhere. You know, you doing the dishes is just as good as them doing the dishes. Right. Because we're one. Right, bro. Right. So it's like when you remove all boundaries, what do we get? We get pea soup and it's like, it's like gunk and it, everything gets funky. You don't know what's your feeling. You don't know what somebody else is feeling. You, there, it's very difficult to have clear discernment. And the mental body is all about discernment. And so is the emotional body. <laughs> because feeling happy and feeling sad are only possible when you actually know what it feels like to feel sad. And you know what it feels like to feel happy. When it's all jumbled together, it's a mix, right? And you don't know what's what. And so there's this incredible practice in spiritual development, which is actually about acknowledging that you're connected to the infinite eternal while actually 
deepening your awareness of discernment in how each and everything is a perfect sacred thing on its own. And, you know, this is what the sort of pantheons of the ancient peoples were about. It was about recognizing I might play this archetype and you might play that archetype and both are sacred. Both are okay. You're okay if you're in that. You're okay if you have that culture. It doesn't mean it's bad because I'm not saying my one God, my one culture is the only way. And if you do something else, you shall die. I mean, that's what we dealt with a lot of trauma around for a couple thousand years now. And and there were was a time where it was like, no, it's cool. You practicing your spirit in that way is perfect for you. And I have maybe a different way. And we maybe just relate to archetypes differently, but we can still actually acknowledge that we're infinite, we're connected to the one, we're, you know, source is source, and that's that. And it is what it is, but we're not trying to like all shove ourselves into one box. And and we'll never be able to do that. We'll never be in one box, right? So we 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 by practicing our individuality, by practicing our sovereignty, we empower ourselves, we empower each other, we create more space for more people to be who they are. And that I think is really the seed of peace on earth. Yeah. And do your own dishes, bro. <laughs> do your own dishes, bro. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, so Adam, you are going to be speaking and presenting at the upcoming LA Conscious Life Expo. Yes, yeah. folks, it's in person. Ta-da. Super excited about that. You get to see your favorite people on stage. Tell us about what you're doing and where we can see you and all the excitement you're going to bring. Yeah, great. Um, we'll make sure to come in for the first night because Friday night, um, February 4th, I'll be in the La Jolla ballroom, the big ballroom uh, from eight to nine 30. I'm doing the ancient mystery of our human origins. So the little seeds that I planted around, you know, where we've come from, what's happened in different areas of the world, what, what evidence do we have of Atlantis and ancient civilizations? I cover all of that and lead us all the way to star nation connections and archetypes and uh, really better understanding who the heck are we <laughs> as human beings? Um, and then Saturday, uh, at noon, I'll be in the George Nori forum. Um, and that's from 12 to two in the Plaza ballroom. And then, uh, on Sunday, I'm on the conscious, uh, cosmic consciousness panel. And that's also in the Plaza ballroom. Um, and that's from five to seven. All of this is on consciouslifeexpo.com if you want to check it out. Um, and, you know, basically that panel is really exploring new theories of consciousness. I'll be sitting on there with some cool cats and mostly sharing my unified physics connections to consciousness for people to give them some tactical stuff to work with. Um, and, uh, and then on Monday, I'm doing a post-conference workshop uh, from two to 4.30 and that workshop is on the Galactic Council. So I'll be literally talking through the intelligent synarchy of species that exist around the galaxy and help people to understand the nature of the relationships between species out there and how we can learn so much from these different advanced cultures in terms of how we can be better stewards of our own planet. Yeah, super exciting. I'm so glad you're joining this year. It's going to be you. amazing and so time. It's been a long time. I was in the Conscious Life Expo many years ago, but um, haven't attended in many years. So I'm, I'm very excited to be back and I'm really, really glad that it's in person. I hope to connect with a lot of you there in person. That'd be wonderful. Yeah. And folks who would like to go and you're listening to this and you live in a different country and it's logistically not possible, just know they also live stream. So you can go to that same website, LAConsciousLifeExpo.com, and you can also get the live streaming. You can purchase it, and just like you're attending in person, you'll see everybody and get to experience what you like. Uh, Adam, this is Dare to Dream. So what are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Mm. Well, right now I'm in the pipeline of creating 
some really amazing technology that uh, the first step is designed around creating infinite royalty trees within uh, the creation of what we call NFTs, but are actually just contracts um, to empower people to collaborate at much larger scales where people can instantly get paid upon the launch of a film, for example. And every person, the videographer, the director, the artists, the creators, all of them can get paid instantly as soon as every time that film is rented. Um, or in art space, remix each other's arts or in music, reach, remix each other's music and have every person that was part of that creation path be able to get paid every time that music sells. So I'm creating that tech right now. Um, and it's part of the core economic system of this 3D social operating system that I'm building, which is basically like a Iron Man style spaceship dashboard for the metaverse that will let you access all of your networks from one place and have powerful peer-to-peer -peer secure communications and be able to create any kind of digital products you want um, and sell courses and sell music and sell film and sell images and whatever right inside the field of your social network space. So that's my work. Um, and, and I've been deep, deep in the process of uh, fundraising and building over the last year. Uh, and this year we're gonna be continuing to ramp up and we'll have some pretty awesome launches hopefully this year, so. And people can fi find you at adamapollo.com, any place else you want to send them. Yeah, I mean, if you Google my name, you can find all kinds of places to find my work. Um, and uh, this bigger ARC project, uh, we've just been teasing just a little bit out there publicly about it. Uh, and you can learn more about that at core.network. Uh, we also just released some really, really cool NFTs called galacticnfts.com. Um, and they're very small, rare sets. We just released a whole Zodiac series that are this gorgeous art by this guy, Aphicles, Charlie Oriana. Um, and they're 12,000 by 12,000 pixels. So they're 144 million pixels, big enough to print in a five foot by five foot canvas. Um, and there's only a couple of each one. Um, but the, the Zodiac ones are, we're selling at low cost and um, hope to have some people come in and purchase those. And every, every purchase of those NFTs and trade of those NFTs supports all of our technology building and all of our social, social work, um, because we're also building tech, tech that serves homeless populations in developing vocation strategies and vocational skills to actually empower them to basically claim their lives back. So we're, we're in partnership with a couple organizations where we're doing really deep on the ground work with, with homeless populations. Um, and so please come and support all of the work we're doing. And uh, I'd love to have you guys reach out if you have any questions and feel free to connect anywhere, anytime. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Debbie. Such a pleasure and honor. I end today's show with this quote from Luke Skywalker, who said, confronting fear is the destiny of the Jedi. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation. And next week on Dare to Dream, I have two guests coming on, Paola Harris and Jacques Vallée. I am so excited about this. Paola is an investigative reporter in the field of unified phenomena research and widely published author. Jacques Vallée, who you might remember, was a Close Encounters. The French scientist was actually him. Uh, uh, was a portrayal of him and all of what he's done. And Jacques will join myself and Paola. Jacques won the Jules Verne Prize for writing. He's an astronomer with a PhD in artificial intelligence and a scientific consultant on unidentified flying objects. Thank you so much for joining us today. And remember folks, you can be sovereign and you can employ some of the amazing magical tips that Adam shared today. Happy New Year.